slovenský top podcast Krok vpred. Takže ahoj, tu je Roman a podcast Krok vpred a môj dnešným hostom je Von. Von je angličan and we will speak in English. Von, welcome. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very happy that you came all the way from sunny <laughs> England <laughs> to foggy Slovakia. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's not too sunny at the moment, but it's not too bad. Uh-huh. And I've had amazing weather whilst I've been in Slovakia. Um, it's been great. People uh-huh. are very friendly, very welcoming. So uh-huh. I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here. It's been really, really good. Von, I'm doing this podcast, especially for young people, to give them uh, different opinions or possibilities on different topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe in those days world young people are orientated quite on on information they're getting from social media from instagram uh, and they forgetting for example where they want to go with all, all those information or where yep. they came from okay and this is how we can uh, bridge to our team we will speak a bit more about history sure why it's good to know your history your mm-hmm. nation history your in inherited history yeah sure so tell me a bit more about your historical background i know that you've been studying at university in england sure so i went to university um 2009 2012 mm-hmm. um studied history um always something i'd been interested in um as from i guess being a kid um even mm-hmm. it, and for me it was always something that i found quite interesting because it always sort of um sparked my imagination mm-hmm. and a lot of the time the thing that always seemed was great for me was it was a world so different to ours that i found it really engaging and really mm-hmm. interesting um and you know i guess being in england you know like most of europe we've got amazing history um so it always sort of if we went on hold of my parents we'd always tend to go sort of a castle or some sort right. of ruins or And it was always that sort of spark of interest um, that really sort of kicked it off for me. Um, and then as I went through school, I found it more and more interesting. Uh-huh. Um, what did you study? What, in school? Uh-huh. I mean, at university. Oh, at university. So I, we, you studied a broad range, but I sort of really focused on like medieval history. Okay. Um, I specialized in the wars of Edward III. So that was, well, Edward III was um, 1327 to 1377. <laughs> So about, it's only about 50 years, which I know is very niche. Uh-huh. Um, and I specialized in my undergraduate, um, the Wars of Edward III, um, so against France, and like the start of the Hundred Years' War. So that's what mm-hmm. I did for that. And then when I went back to do my master's, I looked at um, like a 22-year period, which is very specific, okay. <laughs> um, from 1377 to 1399. And a lot of the research was on um, social and military history. Mm-hmm. And essentially looking at way how people's Um, advances in the military would then have a big knock-on effect on their social standing mm-hmm. um, because you find in this period that there's a real increase in the rise of I guess what we'd call professionalism mm-hmm. so people essentially realizing that they were good at fighting or they could get paid for it mm-hmm. and as a result of this you see this big sort of shift in the formation of the military what, what how it appeared the tactics and as well people's lives would change too you know if they were particularly good They get paid more. Mm-hmm. So you have these people who came from quite poor gra- backgrounds being mm-hmm. able to improve their social standing because they were successful when they went away to war. And I think so those days, 13th something, yeah, it was just few occupations, I would say. You yeah. could be what? Like uh, agronomy? A blacksmith expert, yeah? or, um, you know, like a laborer or carpenter. Uh-huh. Um, so very sort of like manual labor. And because the more prestigious jobs were reserved for the, the higher classes. Mm-hmm. And the military became this sort of, the, this way in or this way of people being able to sort of think, you know what, I can actually improve my standing socially mm-hmm. because I'm um, uh, because I, I, I'm good at fighting, which I know seems a little bit oh, barbaric point, yeah. in a sense, but, you know, and, and it's especially sort of a generation where we're very sort of anti-conflict. But it's say you know what I mean like it, but, but for back but for back then it was a really sort of good way of people uh, for people to be able to sort of um, I guess take the future in their own hands because a lot of the time people didn't have a choice whether they were f- they had to fight or not mm-hmm. so for people to take advantage of it you know if the opportunity as is for anything I guess But I, I believe it was a very violent period of, oh, of massive, humankind yeah. and it was absolutely normal to stab someone right I mean that was how they solved the problems right. 
Yeah, I think, I'm, 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 I'm the, the, you know, I mean, I think especially between sort of like, you know, kings and conflicts, especially, England, especially in that period, there's huge sort of wars mm -hmm. um, with France. I mean, the Hundred Years' War was, um, called the Hundred Years' War, but actually over a hundred years. Mm -hmm. um, huge and massive periods of conflict, very sort of violent um, and, you know, bloody battles. Okay, I you mentioned you've been in, in a war with France, right? Mm -hmm. And now let's do this in a funny way. Okay. Uh, you don't show finger, right? One finger, middle finger, you don't show in England. Mm -hmm. You show in two fingers. Yes. And you know, I mean, I heard the story behind yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't think so. It's so common to, can you explain this? So this it's a bit more of a, it's not strictly true. Yeah. So, but, so it's a bit of a myth. So, um, because the English were famed for their archers and their ability, which they no doubt were, don't get me wrong, the English archers um, at battles like Agincourt were so vitally important. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we use them to really sort of our advantage um, and could really sort of sway the tide of several battles where the English were massively outnumbered like Agincourt, they could really turn the tide. And that was advanced technology, right? Yeah, the longbow and, you know, uh -huh. using, you know, bows and sort of different formations. And rather than the English being on horseback, like they traditionally were with knights, they would all be dismounted and on foot. Uh -huh. So the legend goes that when yeah. the French would capture the English archers, they would chop off their two fingers. Yes. The two fingers that they would use to draw the bow with. Uh -huh. As a result of this, they apparently say that the actual the symbol of you know doing that to somebody was comes from because the french used to chop the english archers fingers yeah, off and they're showing we still have the fingers yeah this right? yeah they still do it now um but how much truth is in that is very sort of skeptical but it's a good story to tell uh -huh. and i think you know it's it's one of those things like even something like that can get somebody interested in history like for me yeah. you know as i remember this one moment when i was a kid the you know, Royal Armouries, you're familiar with mm -hmm, Lee, don't mm -hmm. you? So we, we used to go to the Royal Armouries quite a bit when I was a kid. Actually, I've been there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so many swords there on, on the walls, so many. It's amazing. Um, and one of the things that really sort of stuck with me was we would go there quite a lot when I was younger. And they used to have sort of like uh, actors who would pretend to be from that period. Uh -huh. And one of them was a guy pretending to be an archer from the Battle of Agincourt. <laughs> And he, and for, for some reason, uh -huh. maybe it was sort of like the story that he was telling or the uh -huh. way he told it, it really stuck with me. And I think that's one of the things that really sort of sparked my interest was the way that, and it sounds quite cheesy and quite cliche, that mm -hmm. people bring history to life. Um, yeah. And it's that effort that goes into that and people's commitment to that. For me, that really made it interesting. And to be honest, actually, this is bringing history to life in England, yeah. even in those days, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, all right, Vaughn. Uh, Let's go back and okay. let's start with the, with the word history. Mm -hmm. What means history? So history comes from the Greek historia, mm -hmm. um, which means to um, acquire knowledge by investigation. Mm -hmm. And so I guess that's the entire history is discipline. You're looking to inquire knowledge about your past or previous events, um, be it social, cultural, economic, military, mm -hmm. um, by looking at what's happened previously and using then like a degree of analysis mm -hmm. and evaluation to really sort of build a true picture and essentially make an argument for a case for something. And I don't think so. History word is synonym for truth, right? Mm -hmm. History and truth might be two different things. Yeah, because I think a lot of history, an important part of it is mm -hmm. undoubtedly myths and untruths do play their part. Mm -hmm. Because if you can pick apart the myths and you can pick apart the untruths, you can essentially then find the truth, if that makes sense. So you're, yeah. you've got to sort of pick it, you've got to sort of work your way with sources and materials to really sort of find a way of um, exploring mm -hmm. fact. Um, but with history, you can learn so much about social history mm -hmm. by looking at myths mm -hmm. and the untruths because if you look at those sort of parts of things you can learn so much about the stories that people tell or the way pe or what was important to people you can learn a lot about people's people social history mm -hmm. by looking at what was incorrectly if that makes sense yeah if i'm sort of explaining that in the right way yeah so you can learn a lot about social history by looking at the stories that people told that weren't mm -hmm. necessarily true so myths and legends and um, that those sort of themes do have a really important role to mm -hmm. play, I would say. And it's some kind of message. Yeah. And uh, you are receiving this message as a general public, or me or you as individuals. Mm -hmm. And I would divide all the people into two groups regarding this topic. Mm -hmm. And you have believers or yep. seekers. And you can take from history 
the angle or your yeah. perspective if you you can believe mm -hmm. what is written or if you if you think about things you put one and one together and you may end up <laughs> with number three not, yeah. not with number <laughs> one right yeah you don't have to necessarily believe everything what is written or what is standard for history and you can create your own perspective on things which happened right? absolutely and i think that's the beauty of like history is studying at university and you know as an academic pursuit in general mm -hmm. you're not just taking what's there as what is necessarily you know your opinion you don't have to take that as your opinion you can use those facts you can make your own arguments and i say that's one of the best parts about discipline um in general i'd say to study it is that it really gets people to think about constructing um really thorough and um important arguments and being able to um write and say vocalize your thoughts to be able to use these facts and create sort of an argument mm -hmm. um and something that will persuade somebody around to your way of thinking and that's one of the best things about history i would say is that you can use everything at your disposal mm -hmm. to really sort of come across um to put across sorry your own opinion your own sort of um you know your your own argument or your own take on something mm -hmm. within obviously your reason um but that's one of them i'd say one of the main advantages of it mm -hmm. Uh, I think so. Uh, subject history we can use when you're considering your own identity, mm -hmm. right? And I believe most of people uh, they go back in time, maybe to their grandparents, yep. and maybe a little bit to the grand grandparents. Uh, why you think is that? Why we take as a framework only maybe 100 years ago? Is it because our life is maybe only eight years long? Mm -hmm. I think. Part of Why it. Why we don't go back like five hundred years? Part of it, I think, is the actual accessibility of the material, okay. the actual source material, because you find that I guess unless you're a lord or a king or you know in the high, you've got you can really trace uh -huh. your lineage quite easily. Whereas if you're you're from the lower classes, it's harder to do it because people's lives weren't documented. I mean, look today, it's you know it's amazing because we've you know people document their lives on Facebook, Instagram, mm -hmm. Twitter, that sort of thing. You can really build up a profile of somebody by because they've got like a, a social footprint shall we say this is interesting i never I never think about it like this that my grand grandchildren will look at me maybe through the facebook there you go and they will know exactly what kind of man i was that's it so you you know if my i don't know two generations time my family could be able to access my instagram they'd see that i was in bratislava this week you know and it, it's that like so okay. so that sort of because that didn't the uh -huh. ease of information the ease of data uh -huh. And people didn't document their lives as readily back then. I mean, don't get me wrong, we've got diaries, we've got sort of, um, there's, especially if you go further back with you know, medieval history, you can find um, these information, it's called Calendars of Inquisition Postmortem, uh -huh. which look at, which are like wills, and it was essentially like a list of all the possessions that somebody had when they died. Uh -huh. um, you can find these, but these were only really reserved for um, uh -huh. people of higher classes. So it's, I guess the main reason why we don't go further back is one, because it's pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so we, as a people, tend to only go back 100 years or so because mm -hmm. that's where we can really find the information. And the further back you go, the more obscure it becomes. So my my dad looked, he managed to trace our family back to about 1800. All right. But after that, it then gets a little bit sketchy uh -huh. because you lose the records. Um, Actually, one, uh, I just came to idea that in that time, five, 1500, 1600, there was no need to record your individual history. Mm -hmm. Maybe you didn't uh, mean that much to the society as an individual. Yeah. Yeah. You was just one of one million, even we are one of one million now, mm -hmm. but now through the Facebook, Instagram, everything is focused on individual identity, right? Yeah. Everyone is, everyone matters. Everyone is presenting himself. Mm -hmm. And when you see, for example, painting, paintings from 16th century, you have maybe king, maybe his family, but you don't have paintings of, of poor peasants or blacksmiths. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're, you are... It the, didn't matter that time. Definitely like, right. What did it, you do? It's almost if people have a greater conscious of themselves now. People are sort of... Yeah. And I guess we have a... And rightly so, you know, everybody deserves an absolutely equal chance at sort of being able to um better themselves and everybody should be taken as an individual but it's interesting in terms in terms of like anthropology mm -hmm. and i guess sociology you look back and 
it, it's the thing is though, I I think these people back then did have that. Obviously, people people still have dreams and people still have aspirations, mm -hmm. but they just weren't documented. Like so, we for example, you know, you you I don't know if you're you want like a nice house or something. There's Pinterest. You can go on Pinterest and document it mm -hmm. and sort of say, look. And if you looked at someone's Pinterest, you could arguably say, oh, this is what this person wants in life because mm -hmm. they've put oh they want like a nice house or they want like a bathroom with like you know, a nice bath or that sort of thing. You can find out what people's aspirations are about by looking at their forms of social media. I think people in the past definitely, they 100% would have added their own aspirations, but they made be, they kept them themselves maybe. Although uh -huh. there wasn't a, a public way of documenting them, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Or maybe they put it into songs. Yeah, or that. Or people, you know, people put it into diaries mm -hmm. and they write them down and, you know, these diaries are unfortunately lost. Um, <laughs> and so I think, I think people will have had aspirations uh -huh. but they would have vocalized them and mm -hmm. sort of made them Publicly, uh, public yeah. they, they would have made, made people aware of them in a very different way um because i can't imagine a society where people would never mm -hmm. sort of want that drive and want mm -hmm. that ambition um but yeah fair enough uh Vaughan, you've been studying history mm -hmm. you've been studying it at university yeah and uh, we've been talking before that we both agree that history is made by winners right so uh, what's your take on how true or how valid was the information which you get at, at the university degree as, or the knowledge or the facts which they were presented to you? Yeah. How valid are they? I mean, how true, how correct are they? You know I, what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. I think um, history is always, yeah, it, it, for the... There's a big sort of movement now and sort of the past sort of 15 years of trying to, you know, like there's always been this this sort of thing, history's always documented by the winners, which, mm -hmm. you know, in the, I guess in the past undoubtedly, but there's a big sort of movement at the moment for people really to try and sort of like turn that on its head. And because we, if you're just looking at the people who've been victorious in something, you don't really get the full impression. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in terms of the fact and how truth are the truths that we know, I guess if you look at it philosophically in the past you're never a hundred and hundred a hundred percent going to know mm -hmm. what actually happened so i guess one of the the things that really sticks in my mind is when i was doing my degree with it's a big case study um for um a battle in scotland in mm -hmm. 1314 mm -hmm. at a place called bannockburn and still to this day historians can't um really decide where this battle was taking place. There's so many conflicting sources and people have different opinions and even down to sort of reading the way that the battles, the lay of the land was described and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. So, the, and we had to write this assignment that was on, you know, where was the battle taking place? And ultimately mm -hmm. you come to the decision of, you can make really good arguments in one place, you can make really good arguments for another place. Mm -hmm. Those sort of things you'll ultimately never 100% know. Um, and... But, you know, th things things surprise you sometimes. Like, I guess, perfect example in Leicester when they found, you know, the body of Richard III. Mm -hmm. They never thought they'd find him and they found him in a car park. So there are, yeah, yeah, the, yeah so there are exceptions to this. There are exceptions to okay. that we might never know. Mm -hmm. But there's always that chance that we do, that we will be able to find some sort of mm -hmm. completely empirical, pa empirical facts that proves mm -hmm. something. Um, so in terms of, what you're taught and the facts that you're given to learn with, mm -hmm. I think, yeah, you know, I, th there are undoubtedly some sort of facts that are completely mm -hmm. in question, but the mm -hmm. further you go back in history, there's more ambiguity because like we said earlier, the source material isn't as rich. It's hard to sort of get a full impression of the picture, mm -hmm. which is why it's so important that when you do study history, you do use those skills, like those, that analytical ability, that that really sort of mm -hmm. a, attuned sort of evaluative um, approach that you'll get to really look at the source material and actually use your own judgment and your own knowledge of that time to really pick these sort of um, sources to, apart. Because mm -hmm. you can have a, a chronicle that was written by an English knight, for example, that's going to be very much from that English knight's point of view. Mm -hmm. But it's not to say it's not important. It's important, but you've got to take it in context of everything else that was happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like we were saying earlier about with society and um, mm -hmm. the... Uh, sort of looking at the myths and the untruths mm -hmm. if you can find a lot of those um and they can actually be quite useful because you can tell a lot about the attitude of people at the time so 
Yeah, but to sort of bring it back, I think the the good thing about studying history is that you're going to be able to dig deep mm -hmm. and really sort of study all things in detail mm -hmm. and use those abilities that you've got to really make a judgment of it and think independently about it and form your own opinions rather than just sort of taking what somebody else is saying as completely true. You can make your own arguments and your own opinions um, about something. Ron, you mentioned this night that he wrote down his own history. Yeah. And that history might be different from other knights mm -hmm. who wrote their diary. Mm -hmm. And I think so it was in Slovakia like one year ago. They made research. They put uh, people in a theater mm -hmm. to watch the play. And then they asked them individually to write down the, the play's um, structure. Yeah. And they they were all fine or 100% identical, maybe in the first three, four minutes. Mm -hmm. And then slowly, slowly, the story started to be slightly different. Yeah. They came to the basically the same end, but the middle was different. The, the middle yeah. was completely different. And imagine how it can affect the how we perceive our history. Yes. It's just different sources. Like, you know, this, this, this game we've been talking before, it is called uh, Whisper's Telephone yeah, or yeah. Hidden Telephone. Hidden, yeah, yeah. And when someone says, you're sitting in a, in a round, mm -hmm. and first person says something to another one, he shares it with another. Yeah. And at the end, you get completely different outcome yes. from the initial story. So maybe this should be the, the healthy boundary, how we should perceive the history that it was twisted yeah, I think you're... In some descent. You're always going to... The fascinating thing for me was always looking at the source, different opinions on the same event mm -hmm. and people pick up on different things. You know, so you can have, say... And the way people... Like you write, say, in the play, somebody, the way somebody would write about a certain event would be really important to them, mm -hmm. whereas right. another event would be really different. So there could be a part in the play that was really stuck in someone's mind mm -hmm. and there could be a part in the play that didn't stick in someone's mind, but another part did. And that's what you get with like a lot of sources. You'll have, say, somebody who writes about this amazing sort of like one-on-one -on -one combat between these two individuals mm -hmm. because they were there and they stood right next to it. And for them, that was really important. Whereas you can have somebody writing about the same battle, but because they were either in a different place mm -hmm. or because they were focused on something else, the importance of that doesn't necessarily get picked up on. It might get mentioned in passing mm -hmm. or as an afterthought mm -hmm. rather than as one of the main events. And so I think what you've said about the play is an absolutely amazing example of that. You, you'll, have, you'll, you'll have the beginning and the end will be very, very similar, uh -huh. but the middle can be quite murky yeah. because your people are going to you know, pick up on different events. And that re you can learn a lot about people by the way that they pick up on events. You know, for example, why is this one event important to this person? Well, because they're from this background, this is important to them, they believe this. Um, they went, they have X, Y, and Z knowledge previously. Mm -hmm. And you can really learn a lot about people from their perception of events and how they perceive things. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the most, more, really useful as well, because you learn a lot about the individual, the storyteller, as much of the event mm -hmm. that's, as much as the, the, as the event that's taking place. Got it. Even when we're talking about history, mm -hmm. we, I believe history is interconnected to our future. Mm -hmm. And what's your take on what will be perception of future generations, let's say 400 years from now, about our times, in times of Cambridge Analytica, mm -hmm. of time, in times of hoaxes, we, we get all the Western community, we get information from, for example, Reuters, yeah. and they have their standards of viewing things or mm -hmm. spreading a message. I think we're, it's going to be really interesting. I mean, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to be here in, in 100 years to witness it, but I think... And why should we care, right? <laughs> no, it's, I, I don't think... <laughs> I, I think it's more that it's going to be difficult to write about almost in a contradiction. It's going to be difficult to write about something because there's going to be so much information. Mm -hmm. Like you, if Because right. there's only a finite amount of information you can actually put into a piece of writing. And I guess, so it's going to be amazing because there's going to be all this facts and all these different opinions and all this wealth of information on something. But... So I, I think we are going to perhaps almost avoid ambiguity. Mm -hmm. and But then you've got different elements like you know, fake news. And with statistics and information about things, people, it's so easy to sort of warp and sort of change statistics. So you could write an article um, on, say, I don't know, 
anything really and you can Come on there is a joke that it's a joke actually that 70 percent of statistics are made up there you go <laughs> but it's, it's correct well, it's like statistics and data can you can essentially take statistics and data to fit any argument you've got mm-hmm. you can use statistics like football like in football for example mm-hmm. you can use any sort of stats any sort of data to really sort of say anything um so in a way we're sort of because people are always trying to sell an idea or sell sort of mm-hmm. a way or promote an idea about something, it's going to be increasingly difficult to actually write about, and maybe maybe it's going to be really difficult to write about an event mm-hmm. because there's going to be so many warped opinions of it. So although there's all this information around and we live in this world where people want to know the truth, mm-hmm. but at the same time, there's also all these other ways and all these other facts of people actually sort of actually um, using the information at present to really... I guess distort what's actually happening mm-hmm. for you know to advance companies or anything really. Um, so I think we'd you know it's going to be interesting to see how disciplines like history mm-hmm. sort of do develop because you're going to be I guess you, you're going to have so much information, so much fact, but at the same time you're probably going to have an equal amount of you know quote unquote fake news and other things that will actually distort that. Yeah. So it's gonna be difficult. I you know undoubtedly I guess for And you will have statistics on both opinions, exactly. not even one, right? Yeah. And which one to choose? Yeah. It's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be so mm-hmm. hard. So I think in terms of being able to actually look at things through a really sort of analytical lens and mm-hmm. actually be able to pick things apart is going to be more and more important as we go mm-hmm. forward. Because we know ourselves like the media in you know I, I guess in in certain situations give us so many sort of stories and stuff and it, it is hard to sort of pick in between um and look in between the lines to actually see what's exactly happening media yeah you yeah. have one event and two completely different uh, opinions about it right you have like left wing yeah. media and you have right wing yeah and they have their interest and they um, twist the truth or they play with the truth yeah the opinion as they perceive the the story yeah Okay, well, uh, maybe just to finish it, mm-hmm. uh, you was telling me fine example uh, of one company because it will be important to to proceed with information which we mm-hmm. gathered uh, as we live in here for future generations. Mm-hmm. But probably they will not. We will not leave USB sticks or mm-hmm. CDs or video cassettes for our future generations. You was saying me. You was telling me. Find yeah. an example of how it could look in the future. Yeah, so I think in terms of data, there's this company mm-hmm. um, that we're trying to figure out how we can store mass amounts of data mm-hmm. um, that will never be lost. So if you remember, like you were like you saying, like memory sticks are probably going to become obsolete, mm-hmm. CD-ROMs pretty much are, um, floppy disks certainly are, and it's how do we store this information. Mm-hmm. So this one company is coming up with this sort of like ingenious way of... Yeah. Um, getting say a piece of text, um, a video of a speech and a picture. Mm-hmm. And what they were doing was they broke all this down into binary code. So like zeros and ones. Mm-hmm. And then they transferred that binary code into DNA. Mm-hmm. So DNA coding. Um, and then from that DNA coding, what they then proceeded to do was then form it into a helix. Mm-hmm. So this information went from being text, video, picture to a DNA helix. And the justification was that people are always going to want to look at our DNA. We're always going to want to look at our DNA and really sort of dig deep and discover who we are as a species um, and other species as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And so what they found was they could take this helix structure um, in a vial, Mm -hmm. um, give it to another company, looked at it under a microscope, Uh and then you can actually unravel it, I guess, and then come back with the actual raw i guess the the, the pictures mm-hmm. and the you know the text the video and the um the picture that you originally had and it, it it's, it, it's fascinating how we got to use and store big data mm-hmm. or important data for future generations and i think because the technology is always becoming obsolete so for me it was really interesting in the yeah. sense that they're looking at they're already trying to predict what um uh technology will become obsolete now but they're trying to predict mm-hmm. what's going to become obsolete in the future they're trying to predict obsolete um technology now so people in the future will still be able to get access to big data and big information that we can use now so it'd be interesting to see how it develops um you know and we're always going to use microscopes and uh-huh. i guess in a way i guess we're probably always going to use paper as much as we probably don't want Good to and, and hate well yeah as much as you know it's you're bad for the environment and that sort of, and you know 
I think ultimately, I guess people people are always going to use paper. It's uh, 2019. I have paper and pen here. <laughs> exactly, because there's there's always something quite permanent about using mm-hmm. paper. I guess it's what people like. Because if you know people, I use like notes on my phone all the time. Write things in mm-hmm. notes all the time, and my phone gets destroyed or iCloud gets mm-hmm. corrupted or whatever. I'm, I, mean, I hope it doesn't. Touch wood. Yeah, that I'll I'll lose that. But if I put something in a notepad, unless it was destroyed or water damaged. I'm not going to lose it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something quite sort of permanent about Mm -hmm. pen and paper that people still quite like. Juan, what a story to finish this talk about (laughs) history. Thanks. And hopefully, guys, you enjoyed it. And history matters. Yeah, it does. And your own individual history goes beyond 100 years or your family tree. Absolutely. And hopefully we showed even to one person that history is interesting Mm -hmm. and it's maybe worth of studying. Absolutely. Um, I'd say... If you are interested in it, it's one of those subjects that you really get the benefit out of when you find like your own sort of little bit of interest. So if you go into university um, and you're looking to study history, find that one thing that mm-hmm. really makes you interested in it and just build out your um, your personal statement and your sort of interest from there. Just find that one thing and then you'll find everything else will sort of come easily afterwards. All right. My today's guest was Juan from University of Essex. Thank you very much. Mike. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.